Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White, and today's lesson is on oxidation reduction reactions. We're going to talk about how to formally assign oxidation states to atoms and molecules. We'll talk about redox reactions where uh, electrons are taken away from molecules and atoms that are oxidized and added to molecules and atoms that are reduced. Uh, we'll talk about how to break redox reactions into half reactions uh, in electrochemical cells and use that uh, chemistry to drive electrical circuits. And we'll finally talk about how to look up half reaction potentials and calculate the standard uh, cell potentials for electrochemical cells. So formal oxidation states are assigned on the basis of rules, and the first rule is the oxidation state of a free element is zero. For any free monatomic ion, the oxidation state of that ion is the charge of the ion, and the sum of all oxidation states in a molecule is equal to the overall charge of the ion. So in compounds of different substances, metals generally get positive uh, oxidation states, and the most electronegative nonmetals get their preferred negative oxidation states. Everything else gets uh, an oxidation, oxidation state in between in order to satisfy the sum rule, particularly number three and number two. So let's take a look at example, some examples. In CO2, we have two oxygen atoms uh, with their preferred minus two oxidation state, and so the carbon has to be plus four in order to, for the overall molecule uh, to be uncharged. CO, on the other hand, only has one oxygen atom, so the carbon atom is plus two. In graphite, uh, the formal oxidation state is zero because carbon atoms can't take electrons away from each other. But in methane, uh, carbon is bound to an electro electropositive hydrogen atom because it's in group one. And so the hydrogen, uh, each hydrogen atom has a plus one uh, oxidation state. There are four of them, so the carbon has to be minus four. H2, Cl2, O2 and O3 are all forms of elements, and so they are likewise, like, like graphite, uh, their formal oxidation states are zero. HCl is happy because uh, chlorine is electronegative, hydrogen is electropositive, sodium chloride the same way. Uh, potassium permanganate is an interesting case because you have four electronegative oxygen atoms, each with minus two oxidation states, so you have a minus eight charge there, and that has to be balanced by the two metals. The potassium can take at most one charge because it's a group one metal, so the manganese must take a plus seven oxidation state, which fortunately it can do. Zinc oxide is happy. Uh, it, it, both the metal and the oxygen are in their preferred oxidation states. Likewise, calcium fluoride. Uh, HO2 is an interesting case because the, each oxygen atom wants to be minus two, but the hydrogen can only be plus one because it's in group one. So the oxygens have to split uh, the charge, and so each of them is minus one half. Uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, plus one for each hydrogen atom, and so the, each oxygen atom can be at most minus one. Water is happy. Uh, OF2 is a rare case where oxygen has a plus two oxidation state because fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen. Uh, each fluorine atom has, an, has its preferred oxidation state of minus one, and that forces the oxygen atom to be in the plus two state. So let's put these together in redox reactions. Here we have the oxidation of methane to make uh, CO2 and water, and you can see that the uh, carbon atom goes from a formal state of minus four to plus four, and that involves uh, these formal um, subtraction of eight electrons. The oxygen atoms, there are four of them, each goes from a formal oxidation state of zero to minus two in the products, and there are uh, four of them, so that involves an overall eight electron transfer to balance it. The four hydrogen atoms remain in an unchanged state as at a formal plus one oxidation state. So let's take a look at um, the uh, zinc and silver half reactions. Here we have zinc being oxidized to zinc ions, uh, silver being reduced to um, uh, silver ions, and or to silver metal. And um, we do this in two separate containers. Um, 
because there aren't any bonds that are made or broken between the zinc and the silver directly. And so the advantage of separating the oxidation process from the reduction process is to force the electrons to travel in an external wire or circuit to perform electrical work. So we can do this by constructing a galvanic cell. And for example, oxidation in this cell takes place at the anode on the right-hand side, where the zinc electrode is converted to zinc ions in a zinc sulfate solution. Reduction takes place at the cathode on the left-hand side, where silver ions from a silver nitrate solution are deposited as, as silver metal on the silver electrode. And the electrons travel through the external circuit, or, or the wire, that's between the two electrodes. In this case, uh, the zinc is being oxidized, so the electrons travel from right to left. Um, Char formal current actually travels in the opposite direction of electrons, and so it goes from um, left to right. And there's a porous barrier between the two solutions. If we didn't have this, then uh, electrons traveling on the wire would cause the left-hand side of this cell to build up a negative charge and the right-hand side a positive charge. Uh, instead, ions migrate through the porous barrier to neutralize that charge and allow the current to continue to flow. So if we look at half-reaction potentials, we can look up in tables uh, two half-reactions that together add up to an overall redox, redox reaction of interest. So in this case, I have calcium uh, metal, which is being oxidized to calcium ions, and when I have ozone, which is being reduced to oxygen and water. And so um, from my table, I can look up the reduction potential of calcium ions to calcium metal, but I actually have to turn this around uh, to write it as an oxidation. And so the oxidation potential, instead of being minus 2.76 volts, is plus 2.76 volts. Um, the uh, ozone uh, is being reduced, and I find that directly in the table, and so I write its reduction potential as 2.07 volts. The overall reaction is now just the sum of the balanced reactions, including the electrons, which have to cancel, and so the overall cell potential is the sum of the oxidation and the reduction potential, which in this case is 4.83 volts. Now, standard cell potentials refer to standard conditions. That is to say, all the chemical species are present at one bar pressure, one molar uh, concentration for uh, aqueous species, uh, pure solid or pure liquid uh, for electrodes and for um, uh, solvents. Now, the cell potentials are a measure of intrinsic driving force for the reaction. So uh, don't multiply the cell potentials uh, or the oxidation potentials or reduction potentials by stoichiometric coefficients. So for example, if I react calcium uh, as an oxidation, I get the uh, same oxidation potential as in the last slide, 2.76 volts. And now if my reduction reaction involves sodium, I actually need to multiply the sodium reaction by two in order to balance the number of electrons. And so my overall reaction has two moles of sodium ions being reduced to sodium metal. But the, electro, the reduction potential I write as a straight minus 2.71 volts without multiplying that by 2. And so when I add the oxidation and reduction potentials, I get an overall cell potential, which is plus 0.05 volts. Now, we've seen that the Gibbs free energy of reaction is a measure of the thermodynamic driving force toward uh, reactants or toward products. Uh, a negative delta G for reaction means an intrinsic driving force toward products. Likewise, the uh, overall standard cell potential is an intrinsic measure of uh, the driving force for a redox reaction. Uh, the difference is that um, the E0 cell, if it's positive, uh, that indicates a driving force toward products instead of being negative, and it's not dependent on the stoichiometric coefficients that we use for the balanced reaction. So both of these things are in measures of thermodynamic driving force, and the relationship be between them is that the delta G0 for reaction is equal to minus n 
times F times E0 cell for the reaction, where N is the number of moles of electrons uh, transferred and F is the Faraday constant. So you can see that if I simply multiply all the stoichiometric co coefficients by 2, then N, the number of moles of electrons transferred, is going to double, and that will call d cause delta G to double, but E0 cell is an, is an intrinsic measure, and so it just remains the same. Next time, we will consider the Nernst equation for calculating cell potentials under non-standard conditions, and we'll talk about batteries as primary and secondary cells.